Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the general medicine educator. So in this session I'll try to quickly revise the important multiple choice questions related to infectious diseases. And mainly I'll try to concentrate on the topic of the HIV in this discussion because majority of the questions have been asked on this particular topic in the recent FMG and as well as the NEET PG exams. So the first question of this particular session will be the approximate time interval between the HIV infection and manifestation of AIDS is the options are 7.5 years, 10 years, 12 years and then 11 years. So from the time at which the organism enters into the body and the onset of full blown AIDS will be 10 years. So when will this happen if the individual is not taking any treatment, not taking any retroviral therapy? That is the point when the organism entering into the body and development of full blown AIDS, it will take almost 10 years. Okay. So this is basically we call it as this time interval whichever has been mentioned it is considered as the incubation period right considered as the incubation period for the development of the full blown AIDS. Now under which particular clinical staging according to WHO does this AIDS come under? So we have totally four stages according to World Health Organization. So these are the four stages. Stage 1, the individual is asymptomatic or the individual will have persistent generalized lymphadenopathy will be there. That will be in stage 1. And stage 4 will be the one which is considered as the full blown AIDS. Okay. Or the AIDS defining illnesses. They are present in stage 4. And it takes almost 10 years for an individual not being treated for getting into a state of the full blown AIDS. And what will be the manifestation of the full blown AIDS? The manifestation of the full blown AIDS will be the HIV wasting syndrome, the esophageal candidiasis, then herpes simplex ulceration, lymphoma, Kaposi's sarcoma, invasive cervical cancer, pneumocystis carni pneumonia, extra pulmonary tuberculosis, cryptococcal meningitis, toxoplasma brain abscesses, visceral leishmaniasis and then HIV encephalopathy. So this will be a form of a full blown AIDS and it takes almost 10 years. All right. That was the first question. Second question is which of the following statements about the HIV is true? The options are the HIV 2 is more pathogenic than HIV 1 and HIV 1 subtype C is the most common form worldwide and HIV 2 is prevalent worldwide and donated blood is not screened for the HIV 2. So the question is about which is the true statement. Now if you take the pathogenicity between HIV 1 and HIV 2, remember your HIV 1, it is more pathogenic than compared to that of the HIV 2, right? And you take the subtype C. Now if you take this HIV 1, it is divided into four distinct groups. Right, it is divided into four distinct groups. Out of these four distinct groups, which is more common is subtype C is the most common form worldwide. And third option, if you see, HIV 2 is prevalent worldwide is a wrong statement. It is the HIV 1 which is prevalent worldwide. That will be the true statement, but it is not HIV 2. And fourth point is donated blood is not screened for HIV 2. It's an incorrect statement. So donated blood, it is screened for both HIV 1 and as well as the HIV 2. All right. So the correct answer or the true statement is the HIV 1 subtype C is the most common form worldwide. Okay. So that was about the second question. Third question, if you see, certain individuals are resistant to the HIV infection due to the options are mutation on CXCR4 2Q21 mutation, HLA B35, presence of HLA B35, CCR5 delta 32 mutation and then the presence of the DC sign. Okay. So now what are these CCR5 and as well as CXCR4 I will tell you. But which group of individuals are resistant to this HIV infection is those individuals with CCR5 delta 32 mutation, they are the one who are resistant in acquiring the HIV infection. Now, you take both of these, that is CXCR4 and as well as the CCR5. 
right? Both of these, they are the co-receptors or they are the chemokine receptors, right? They are the chemokine receptors which are present on the surface of, where are they present? They are present on the surface of CD4 plus T helper cells, right? They are present on CD4 plus T helper cells and not only that, they are also present on the macrophages. Now, what is the use of these receptors which are present on CD4 plus T helper cells, right? So, these receptors, they help in fusion of the HIV virus and they help in aiding the entry of the HIV virus. That is the function of this CXCR4 and as well as CCR5 receptors, okay? Now, if this particular CCR5 receptor, if it is being mutated, then the HIV cannot bind to the CD4 cells and cannot enter into the CD4 cells, okay? So, thereby the individual will have resistance in acquiring the HIV infection, okay? So, the correct answer is CCR5 delta 32 mutation, uh, they are resistant to acquiring the HIV infection, okay? Then, the next important thing is, if you take the DC sign. What is DC sign? DC sign is a type of cell surface lectin receptor, right? It is a type of, it is a type of cell surface lectin receptors to which the HIV has the affinity to bind, right? To which the HIV has affinity to bind. Now, the expression of this particular receptor, that is lectin receptor, where is it present? It is present on the dendritic cells. They are nothing but the antigen presenting cells. So, on this antigen presenting cells, that is the macrophages, you have the presence of this lectin receptors, that is DC sign. So, the presence of these receptors will enhance, right, will enhance the infectivity of the HIV virus, right. So, presence of DC sign, remember, they will further enhance the infectivity by HIV virus, okay? But the one or which group of individuals are resistant to the HIV infection, that is the presence of CCR5 delta 32 mutation. If it is being mutated, then the HIV virus cannot bind to the CD4 cells and cannot enter into the CD4 cells and thereby the individual is resistant to the HIV virus infection, okay? Right. That was about the third question. And fourth question, if you see, exposure to which of the following modes of transmission carries the highest risk of acquiring the infection by HIV? The options are needle sharing during injection drug abuse, blood transfusion, unprotected sexual intercourse and then the breastfeeding. So, the one which is having the highest risk of acquiring the HIV infection is by the blood transfusion. So, remember exposure to blood transfusion carries the highest risk of acquiring the HIV, right? And if you take the sequence after the blood transfusion, the next one will be the needle sharing, right? Needle sharing during the injection drug abuse and the next important will be repetitive, right? It is not single, repetitive anal intercourse will have the increased risk of development of the HIV, right? Then followed by that, the next will be the needle stick injury, right? Followed by that will be the sexual intercourse, that is the vaginal intercourse, okay? Vaginal sexual intercourse. So, you know, this is what is the, uh, the descending order. So, the blood transfusion has the highest risk, followed by that will be the needle sharing, okay, right? And what are the other methods of transmission? The other methods of transmission is from the vertical transmission also, that is from the mother to child. But among all, see, you have to remember two points. If the question is asked like which is having the highest risk of transmission, that will be the blood transfusion. But if the question is asked, like the most common mode of transmission worldwide, the most common mode of transmission worldwide will be the heterosexual transmission. That will be the most common mode of transmission for the HIV. Then followed by that, it will be mother to child. That will be the vertical transmission, 
right and followed by that will be the blood transfusion followed by that will be the needle stick injury so you should not get confused with the question here so if the question asks like which is having the highest risk of transmission blood transfusion but if the question asks what is the most common mode of transmission worldwide that will be the sexual transmission all right next then coming to transmission between the genders male to female transmission is more common or female to male transmission is more common remember it is male to female transmission will be more common rather than female to male transmission this is another very very important point right now what about this story of the breast milk and all if you take the viral load in the breast milk and if you take the viral load in the saliva and if you take the viral load within the tears and if you take the viral load within the sweat and even in the urine the viral load in these secretions will be very very minimal in fact in tears sweat and as well as urine the virus is completely absent okay tears sweat and urine the virus is completely absent whereas in breast milk and as well as saliva right this will be a very minimal viral load so that is the reason why these particular secretions they are not responsible for transmission of the hiv because they don't have adequate amount of the hiv viral load and at the same time your tear sweat and as well as urine does not have the viral load at all so here the correct answer is the blood transfusion right now we we'll move on to the fifth question unexplained persistent parotid enlargement in an hiv infected child is characterized in which stage of the hiv according to world health organization so world health organization just now i have shown you there are totally four stages right out of which the presence of persistent parotid gland enlargement is under which particular stage so you take stage 1 most of these patients they are asymptomatic most of them they are asymptomatic or they have persistent right they have persistent generalized lymphadenopathy right persistent generalized lymphadenopathy that will be stage 1 and your persistent parotid gland enlargement comes under your stage 2 right comes under your stage 2 now what are all the organs which are enlarged in stage 2 so if you take in stage 2 it is not only persistent parotid gland enlargement in stage 2 you have persistent hepatosplenomegaly as well right you have persistent hepatosplenomegaly as well right and along that means even the spleen and as well as liver they are persistently enlarged then the ulcerations that is these patients they have recurrent oral ulceration okay so what i will do is i will give you the list of the manifestations that you have in stage 2 so this will be the manifestations in stage 2 unexplained persistent hepatosplenomegaly then pruritic eruptions that to the skin manifestations extensive warts that is also a skin manifestation herpes zoster infection extensive meniscus contagiosum recurrent oral ulceration unexplained persistent parotid gland enlargement this is what is our question linear gingival erythema recurrent or chronic upper respiratory tract infection and fungal nail infection so what is that i want to tell you from this question i want to make you to know that each and every manifestation in the clinical staging is very important because they can take up one clinical manifestation in any of these stage 1 2 3 4 and they will ask you under which particular clinical stage of who does this clinical symptomatology comes under so you need to know each and every manifestation of the individual stages stage 1 and stage 2 is done here stage 3 and stage 4 subsequently i'll discuss that okay right then moving to the next question in hiv positive individual presents with the following what is the diagnosis and who clinical stage of the hiv the options are oral candidiasis and who stage 2 oral haley leukoplakia and who stage 3 oral candidiasis and who stage 
oral aerial leukoplakia and double h for stage 2 okay so what is that you are observing here the presence of white curdy precipitate and that is present over the soft palate so this is nothing but the oral candidiasis seen in double h o stage 3 right oral candidiasis seen in double h o stage 3 so in the previous question we have discussed about stage 2 now let me discuss about the clinical manifestations of stage 3 so this oral lesions uh, having this candidiasis are generally seen when the CD4 count is less than 200 per cubic millimeter. That is the point when this oral candidiasis will develop. Now, whenever you see this particular white patches in HIV individual in the oral cavity, you need to think of two important differential diagnoses. One is your oral candidiasis and the other one is oral hairy leukoplekia. Now, how will you differentiate these two? Let me explain. So, you take this, the oral candidiasis. Oral candidiasis, how does it appear? It appears as white cheesy exudate. Right? It appears as white cheesy exudate. And where exactly is most commonly distributed? It is distributed over the soft palate and as well as the posterior pharynx. Right, distributed over the soft palate and as well as the posterior pharynx. Then how will you diagnose? See, diagnosis is by the direct examination under, the, so you need to take the scraping and direct examination under the microscope. So what is that you will observe under the microscope? The presence of the pseudo hyphal elements. That is what you will observe in the oral candidiasis. Then you take oral hairy leukoplakia. See, okay, so this is your oral hairy leukoplakia. So, this oral hairy leukoplakia, it appears as white frond like lesions. Right, it appears as white frond like lesions. They are present generally along the lateral border of the tongue. Right, they are generally present along the lateral border of the tongue. Okay, so this is very very important. They are generally present on the lateral border of the tongue, and sometimes they are present on the adjacent buccal mucosa. Right, and remember these particular lesions of oral hairy leukoplakia are caused by the Epstein Barr virus. Right. And even though we are using the terminology as oral hairy leukoplakia, this is not a pre-malignant condition. Remember, this is not considered as the pre-malignant condition. Okay, right. So that was about the oral candidiasis. So oral candidiasis, it comes under your stage 3. Now, let me discuss what are all the manifestations that comes under your stage 3. So I have already shown you the uh, findings that come across in stage 2. Then you take in stage 3. You have a big list. Right, just read two to three times before going to your exam. Quickly just give uh, an eye on these clinical staging because one question can be expected from the clinical staging. Okay, so stage three, uh, you have unexplained moderate malnutrition, not adequately responding to standard therapy, unexplained persistent diarrhea, unexplained persistent fever, oral candidiasis. This is what our question is. Then oral hairy leukoplakia. Just now I have shown you. Acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, periodontitis or periodonitis, lymph node tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, bacterial pneumonia, lymphoid interstitial pneumonitis. So, if you see this, how are they getting concentrated, the clinical manifestation? One is oral manifestation. Next is respiratory manifestation, okay, pulmonary tuberculosis, pneumonia and all. Then, chronic HIV associated lung disease including bronchiectasis. So, even this is also lung manifestation. Then unexplained anemia and chronic thrombocytopenia that is on complete blood picture unexplained severe wasting shunt, uh, stunting or malnutrition not responding to standard therapy pneumocystis cadmi pneumonia again it is lung manifestation recurrent severe bacterial infection like empyma pyomyositis bone or joint infection meningitis but excluding the pneumonia so mainly the clinical manifestations of stage 3 are oral respiratory then malnutrition and weight loss and then you have the other system involvement but very minimal okay but mainly on the oral and 
lung remember stage 3 okay right so that was about stage 3 manifestations now which of the following is the most common opportunistic infections in hiv infected individuals the options are mycobacterium tuberculosis disseminated candidiasis cytomegalovirus pneumocystis cerevisiae pneumonia so remember it is mycobacterium tuberculosis that is the most common opportunistic infection in hiv infected individual globally and as well as even in india right and in patients with relatively high cd4 count the typical pattern of pulmonary reactivation can occur it need not be low cd4 count even at a higher cd4 count around 300 350 also there can be reactivation of the existing pulmonary tuberculosis whereas when the cd4 count is low that is when cd4 count is less than 200 then there will be disseminated disease right there will be disseminated tuberculosis whereas on the higher cd4 count there will be reactivation of the existing pulmonary tuberculosis lower cd4 count there will be dissemination of this tuberculosis and if you take the prophylaxis okay the primary prophylaxis will be with isoniazid that is h and as well as the pyridoxine so this isoniazid and as well as pyridoxine they are the one which are used for the primary prophylaxis and right and this isoniazid and as well as the pyridoxine should be given for nearly around 9 months right should be given for nearly around 9 months for hiv infected individuals meeting the following manifestations so which group of individuals you require you need to give isoniazid for 9 months number 1 the tuberculin test that is purified protein derivative skin test has shown in duration of more than 5 mm then you need to give isoniazid prophylaxis then positive interferon gamma right positive interferon gamma release assay you need to give isoniazid for 9 months then if the individual has the history of close household contacts with the tuberculosis in them also you need to give isoniazid for 9 months so this is about the indication for giving prophylaxis in an hiv infected individual right so this was about related to tuberculosis then the next question is a previously untreated hiv positive patient is diagnosed with mycobacterium tuberculosis infection and treatment is started the patient began to feel better Two weeks into treatment, and patient suddenly complains of high-grade fever, severe malaise, headache, worsening cough, and tender nodes are present within the neck. Which one of the following explanation is most likely in this case? The options are resistant to anti-tubercular therapy. Second option: concurrent treatment with antiretroviral therapy. Bacterial endotoxin release due cell death due to death of tubercle bacilli. hypersensitivity reaction to isoniazid so now what exactly this patient has developed is this patient has developed what is called as the iris okay and this particular iris develops when there is concurrent treatment with antiretroviral therapy so when the patient have been started on anti tubercular therapy simultaneously when you start antiretroviral therapy that is the point when the individual will develop what is called iris which is nothing but immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome so then what is that you need to do so once you have started anti tubercular therapy you need to wait for nearly around 2 to 4 weeks okay you need to wait nearly around 2 to 4 weeks for the starting of the anti retroviral therapy when you start the anti retroviral therapy immediately along with anti tubercular therapy then there is chance of development of immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome so basically what happens is once you start anti retroviral therapy what will happen the cd4 count increases and that increased cd4 count will start attacking the tubercle bacilli so the tubercle bacilli are completely killed off and that fragments of the tubercle bacilli which have been released in excess number they will start the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome the tubercle bacilli are the one which are responsible for starting the inflammatory syndrome causing worsening of the headache worsening cough tender nodes within the neck 
okay so concurrent treatment with antiretroviral therapy should not be immediately started and remember at which particular uh, cd4 pound this iris is more common see it is most common in previously untreated patients starting therapy with cd4 plus t cell count when it is less than 50 when cd4 count is less than 50 right and at the same time you have started anti tubercular therapy and anti retroviral therapy there is high chance of starting or developing this immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome okay so please remember this important point whereas hypersensitivity reaction to your isoniazid hypersensitivity reaction to isoniazid is extremely rare and if at all if there is hypersensitivity reaction with isoniazid that will be in the form of maculo papular rash right that will be in the form of maculo papular rash and it is extremely rare okay now the point is when the cd4 count is less than 50 and if you are anticipating that the individual is about to start with iris about to develop this immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome then how do you treat these patients so you need to start the patient on the glucocorticoids right you need to start the patient on glucocorticoids so immunosuppressive drugs such as glucocorticoids may be required to blunt the inflammatory component okay so the treatment for iris will be the glucocorticoids right so the correct answer here is concurrent treatment with antiretroviral therapy right next the next question is about the development of meningitis in patients with HIV which organism is the leading cause of meningitis in AIDS the options are streptococcus pneumonia herpes simplex virus toxoplasma gondii cryptococcus neoformans the correct answer here is the cryptococcus neoformans so this will cause meningitis in HIV infected individual when CD4 plus right CD4 plus T cell count when it is less than 100 per cubic millimeter that is the point when the individual can develop cryptococcal meningitis and the picture with cryptococcus neoformans will be in the form of subacute right it will be in the form of subacute meningoencephalitis in the form of subacute meningoencephalitis and when you do the CSF analysis in case of the cryptococcus neoformans the CSF analysis shows that there is increase in the WBC count and predominantly which cells are elevated in fungal infections it is the lymphocytic predominant and the other parts of the CSF analysis will show you that the glucose levels will be decreased so there will be decrease in the glucose and there will be increase in the proteins within the CSF and what will happen to the opening pressure within the CSF the opening pressure within the CSF will be elevated so CSF opening pressure is elevated right and the next important method by which you will be diagnosing or picking up that cryptococcus is the diagnosis of the cryptococcal meningitis is made by identifying the cryptococcal neoformans yeast cells okay so you will identify or you will see the presence of the cryptococcus neoformans yeast cells within the CSF and the stain that we use is the India ink stain right the stain that you use is the India ink stain and the other method by which you can diagnose this cryptococcus neoformans is the detection of the cryptococcal antigen so this we call it as CRAG. CRAG stands for cryptococcal antigen identification. And this cryptococcal identification is being done by latex agglutination. That is the method by which you will be able to identify the cryptococcal antigen. And if you see the treatment for these patients with the cryptococcus. See during the induction you need to give IV liposomal amphotericin B okay liposomal amphotericin b and this should be combined with flu cytosin and this combination you need to give for nearly around two weeks and this is what is nothing but the induction therapy followed by that will be the maintenance therapy the maintenance therapy it is the oral 
fluconazole and until when you should give this oral fluconazole you should give this oral fluconazole until the cd4 count increases to more than 200 until then you need to give this oral fluconazole okay so or you need to give for at least 6 months you need to give this oral fluconazole okay so that is about your treatment for cryptococcal meningitis uh, now what are the drugs which we can give as the primary prophylaxis the primary prophylaxis against this cryptococcal meningitis will be oral fluconazole right when cd4 count reduces to less than 100 despite whether the individual has developed cryptococcal meningitis or not you need to start the oral fluconazole that is given as the primary prophylaxis so this is about your cryptococcal meningitis causing the meningitis okay right now moving on to the next question which of the following is the multicentric neoplasm of vascular origin in a patients with the aids the options are basilary angiomatosis Kaposi's sarcoma, primary CNS lymphoma, Burkitt's lymphoma. The answer is the Kaposi's sarcoma. So Kaposi's sarcoma, it is the multicentric neoplasm of the vascular origin in patients with AIDS. And what will be the description of this lesion? So if you take this Kaposi's sarcoma, right, let me just give you the description of this lesion. Kaposi's, Kaposi's sarcoma, it is reddish purple vascular nodules right reddish purple vascular nodules that is how the lesions of the Kaposi sarcoma will be now where all it appears it appears on the skin and they also appear on the mucous membrane as well and multicentric not only in the skin and mucous membrane they also have been reported in virtually every organ, right, including heart and as well as the central nervous system. So, these are all the various places where you can have this uh, distribution of Kaposi sarcoma. And what is the organism causing Kaposi sarcoma? That will be HHV8. Okay. Now, when will this occur? When CD4 count drops down to less than 350 to 500 per cubic millimeter that is the point when the individual can develop this Kaposi sarcoma then how will you diagnose this Kaposi sarcoma see diagnosis is confirmed by doing the biopsy okay biopsy is the one which will differentiate Kaposi sarcoma from bacillary angiomatosis then how do you treat these patients combination antiretroviral therapy Combination antiretroviral therapy has been associated with spontaneous regression of the Kaposi sarcoma, right? And this Kaposi sarcoma, it is one of the AIDS defining neoplasm. So, what all neoplasms comes under AIDS defining neoplasm? That includes number one, Kaposi sarcoma is one. Next, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Third, Invasive cervical carcinoma. Right? Invasive cervical carcinoma. These three are considered as AIDS defining neoplasms. Okay? So, that was about your Kaposi sarcoma, which is of multicentric origin of vascular origin in patients with the HIV. Right? Now, we will move on to the next question. A 45 year old HIV positive female presented with raised violaceous papules on the right foot. Biopsy and Rathen Starry stain demonstrated the causative organism. Which of the following is that particular causative organism? The options are Bartonella Hensley, HHV8, Bartonella Quintana, Epstein Barr virus. So, remember, it is the Bartonella Hensley. Now, that is the one which is responsible for this violaceous papule over the right foot. So, this Bartonella Hensley what does it cause it will cause what is called as bacillary angiomatosis right it will cause what is called as bacillary angiomatosis and if you take the biopsy and this bacillary angiomatosis caused by bartonella hensley is more common in 
immunocompromised host, right? And it is an infectious vascular proliferative lesion. And what will be the appearance of this lesion? It is a vascular proliferative lesion presenting as reddish purple nodules, right? Reddish purple nodules, okay? And it is almost appearance similar to that of the Kaposi sarcoma. But how do you differentiate Kaposi sarcoma from bacillary angiomatosis is by biopsy, okay? Now, when you do biopsy, and when we use this Vardin starry stain in case of bacillary angiomatosis, that will reveal tangled bacilli in the lesions. Right? That will reveal the tangled bacilli in the lesions. And what is the drug of choice for this bacillary angiomatosis? That will be erythromycin. So, erythromycin is considered as the drug of choice. And remember, this organism that is Bartonella hensley, it will cause what is called as cat scratch disease in immunocompetent host. Whereas in immunocompromised host, it will cause bacillary angiomatosis. Whereas in immunocompetent host, it will cause cat scratch disease which is nothing but necrotizing granulomatous disorder of the lymph node. Right? Necrotizing granulomatous disorder of the lymph node. Whereas, you take the other options. The other options like the HHV-8. The HHV-8, it is associated with the development of the Kaposi sarcoma. Right? Whereas, you take this Bartonella quintana. Bartonella quintana, which is transmitted by the human body lice. That is associated with the development of the trench fever. Right? That is associated with the development of the trench fever, particularly in World War I. And this is also called as the five-day fever. Whereas, you take the Epstein-Barr virus, that is associated with the development of the infectious mononucleosis. So, this is about your Bartonella Hensley in patients with HIV. Now, we move on to the next question. A 35-year-old HIV positive male has been diagnosed with pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia. Primary prophylaxis for this condition is recommended to be started at CD4 cell. That means the question is about when will you start primary prophylaxis, okay? If the individual has been infected with PCP pneumonia, when the CD4 count less than 25%, CD4 count less than 7%, less than 15%, less than 10%. Remember, when CD4 count is less than 15%, that is the point when you need to start the primary prophylaxis, okay? So, your CD4 count should be less than 15% of the normal or the CD4 count should be less than 200 cells per cubic millimeter for starting the primary prophylaxis for the pneumocystis carney pneumonia. Now, what is the drug of choice for primary prophylaxis? That will be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole which is nothing but the cotrimoxazole, which is nothing but cotrimoxazole. The alternative treatment will be the options like Dapsone or Pyrimethamine. Okay. Or the other alternative agents will be Atovacone. Right. Or Aerosolized pentamidin. Right? Aeros aerosolized pentamidin. So, these are the alternatives for pri primary prophylaxis. But the drug of choice will be trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole. When CD4 count is less than 200 or when CD4 count is less than 15%, in spite whether the individual has developed PCP or not, you need to start this prophylaxis. Okay? So, that was about when to start primary prophylaxis in case of the PCP. Next question is, which of the following is the false regarding pneumocystis carney pneumonia? The options are, glucocorticoids are indicated if partial pressure of oxygen is less than 70 millimeters of mercury. An A gradient that is alveolo arterial gradient more than 35 millimeters of mercury. That is first option. Recent oropharyngeal candidiasis is an indication for prophylaxis. Elevation of lactate dehydrogenase is a common finding. Aerosolized pentamidin is used in the treatment. Okay. So, which is the false statement? 
Just now we were discussing in the previous question that is for PCP, what is that we give? We don't give the aerosolized pentamidin as a drug of choice. It is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole which is used as a drug of choice. Okay, this is not used even for the, I mean, this is not the one which is used for the prophylaxis, which one the aerosolized pentamidin. Then, yes, glucocorticoid should be given if the partial pressure of oxygen is less than 70 and when A gradient is more than 35 millimeters of mercury, it is a true statement. And recurrent oropharyngeal uh, candidiasis is an indication for prophylaxis. Yes, you need to start the prophylaxis with fluconazole. Elevation of LDH may be there in patients with the PCP pneumonia. Then how will you diagnose this PCP? The investigation of choice for PCP will be, you need to do bronchoscopy. Along with the bronchoscopy, you also need to do the bronchoalveolar lavage. This is the most sensitive investigation for PCP. Then you need to observe this fluid under gomori methanamine stain. Right, gomori methanamine stain. Now, if you are unable to do this bronchoalveolar lavage and bronchoscopy, the alternative method is you need to do nebulization with hypertonic saline. Right, you need to do nebulization with hypertonic saline and then you need to induce the sputum. After the induction of the sputum, in that particular sputum, you need to stain with gomori methanamine stain. Okay, that is the alternative one. And what will happen to lactate dehydrogenase levels in uh, PCP? They are being elevated. Right, they are being elevated. Okay, and what is the drug of choice for PCP? Just now we have discussed that is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. What will be the other drugs? The other drugs will be dapsone or pyrimethamine. This dapsone or pyrimethamine should be combined with leucovorin, right? Or the other alternative will be aerosolized pentamidin. See, this aerosolized pentamidin, it is an alternative drug. That is not the drug of choice, right? That is not the drug of choice. And in case of mild to moderate form of the PCP pneumonia, the drugs which are available as an alternative is, apart from uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, the drugs which are available as an alternative is dapsone or trimethoprim. This is one. Next is clindamycin or the primaquin and the other option is atovaquone. Okay. For severe form of the disease, you need to give IV formulations. And this IV formulations include IV pentamidin should be given. And when are these glucocorticoids indicated? When glucocort this uh, partial pressure of oxygen, when the levels are less than 70 millimeters of mercury, that is the point when you need to start the glucocorticoids. Okay. So these are some of the very important points related to the PCP. Next, a woman with HIV was brought to the emergency ward after an episode of generalized tonic-clonic seizures. There is no history of fever, no history of night sweats, no history of weight loss. MRI was done and image is shown below. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? The options are cryptococcal meningitis, primary CNS lymphoma, cerebral toxoplasmosis, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Right. So what is that you are observing here? So you are observing the presence of intracranial space occupying lesion. Right. Now, this particular lesion along with the clinical features is very much suggestive of cerebral toxoplasmosis. I'll tell you why. So, this patient is having the presence of the seizures. So, the diagnosis of cerebral toxoplasmosis is most likely because the presentation in the patient is having seizures with HIV infection. That is the point when which gives us a first important differential diagnosis is cerebral toxoplasmosis. And the other one is, in case of MRI, when you have done, what is that it showing? In the left posterior frontal lobe, right, in the left posterior part of the frontal lobe, you are having the presence of solitary rim enhancing lesion. Right? Presence of solitary rim enhancing lesion. 
that is another important point which is suggestive of cerebral toxoplasmosis and along with that you also have the presence of the edema so this black color one this is nothing but the presence of the vasogenic edema right and not only that there is a very minimal right very minimal midline shift to the right as well and when will this cerebral toxoplasmosis occurs in patients with hiv this cerebral toxoplasmosis occurs when cd4 count is less than 200 in patients with the hiv and it is usually the reactivation of okay reactivation of the latent cyst that is what is your cerebral toxoplasmosis and when you do MRI in patients with cerebral toxoplasmosis what will be the picture most commonly it will be the presence of multiple intracranial space occupying lesions and that too in multiple locations that is the common picture but some cases right some cases there can be a single intracranial space occupying lesion right there can be a single intracranial space occupying lesion okay and when you do a contrast mri the contrast mri will also show that there is inflammation and central necrosis showing the ring enhancement okay so there is inflammation and as well as the presence of right as well as the presence of central necrosis on the contrast MRI and another important sign in the MRI that you see in patients with toxoplasmosis will be the presence of the target sign okay so what exactly is this target sign some of sometimes an eccentric nodular area of enhancement is seen within the ring this is so called eccentric target sign it is typical for the cerebral toxoplasmosis right now what will be the differential diagnosis for this mri having the ring enhancement lesion differential diagnosis for the single or multiple intracranial space occupying lesion in case of hiv will be primary cns lymphoma usually in case of primary cns lymphoma it will be the solitary lesion right it will be solitary lesion and it will be a solid lesion you don't have a central necrosis there and most commonly the distribution is in the subependymal area right most commonly it is in the subependymal area this is one of the differential diagnosis the other differential diagnosis are the tuberculosis then the fungal infections and even the presence of the bacterial abscesses right the presence of bacterial abscesses okay so these are the ways by which i mean this is the differential diagnosis then how do you treat this uh, cerebral toxoplasmosis the drug of choice will be sulfadiazine along with sulfadiazine or the other drug will be pyrimethamine so this pyrimethamine or sulfadiazine should be given along with leucovorin right should be given along with leucovorin and this has to be given for a minimum of four to six weeks right this has to be given for a minimum of four to six weeks okay so that is what is the treatment for the cerebral toxoplasmosis and you have to understand that when to start the primary prophylaxis see uh, this will be the treatment when the individual develops toxoplasmosis but primary prophylaxis if you see the primary prophylaxis is given mainly to prevent the first occurrence of the toxoplasmosis and this is given to a patient with igg antibody to toxoplasma right presence of igg antibody against the toxoplasma or if the cd4 count is less than 100 that is another indication for giving the primary prophylaxis and this primary prophylaxis should be given with double strength the word da stands with double strength of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole when you give double strength of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole that is what is the primary prophylaxis for the 
cerebral toxoplasmosis. Then coming, to, this is about the primary prophylaxis. And if you take the secondary prophylaxis for cerebral toxoplasmosis, remember that is mainly to prevent the recurrence. Right, that is mainly to prevent the recurrence of the toxoplasmosis. And what should be the CD4 count? When CD4 count is more than 200, right, to prevent the recurrence of toxoplasmosis infection, if the CD4 count is more than 200, and you need to give this for nearly around 6 months, okay. When CD4 count is less than 100, definitely you need to give. And after the patient has developed toxoplasmosis, and if the CD4 count has reduced to up to 200, immediately you need to start the secondary prophylaxis. Okay. So that is about your cerebral toxoplasmosis. Then you take the other options in the question because you have the space occupying lesion in the other options also. You take the cryptococcal meningitis. These patients with cryptococcal meningitis, they present with fever. Okay. They present with this projectile vomiting. They present in a state of altered mental status. MS is altered mental status and they have severe headache and they also have meningeal signs. Now, what are these meningeal signs? These meningeal signs, they include the presence of neck rigidity, right? Brudzinski sign. These are the meningeal signs, okay? And the, whereas in case of cryptococcal meningitis, the presence of seizures is very, very rare. The presence of the focal uh, weakness, focal neurological deficit is very, very rare in case of the cryptococcal meningitis. So, seizures, they don't go in favor of your cryptococcal meningitis. Whereas, then what about the primary CNS lymphoma? You said like uh, one of the very, very important differential diagnosis for intracranial space occupying lesion. This primary CNS lymphoma, right, they do present with seizures. Okay. They do present with focal neurological deficit. And along with that, the symptoms of fever, night sweats, and weight loss, they are present in almost 80% of patients. Okay. So, in almost 80% of patients, they have fever, night sweats, and weight loss. But what is our patient having? There is no history of fever, no history of night sweats, no history of weight loss. So, that will take out your primary CNS lymphoma. Right? Whereas you take progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is caused by the JC virus. And this is an AIDS defining illness. And what is this actually? This is a demyelinating manifestation of, right? This is the demyelinating manifestation of subcortical white matter, right? Demyelination in subcortical white matter, okay? And where exactly will be this subcortical uh, demyelination? That demyelination will be in the cortical areas, right? In the cortical areas that you can observe within the MRI in patients with the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, right? Which is caused by JC virus. So, because there is no fever, no night sweats, no weight loss, that is the reason why the answer is the cerebral toxoplasmosis okay the one important area where you can get confused here is with the primary cns lymphoma because primary cns lymphoma usually they present with the solitary lesions but solitary lesions in some cases can be seen even in toxoplasmosis also but the point which is going against your primary cns lymphoma is there is no fever there is no weight loss and there is no night sweats that is going against your primary cns lymphoma right now moving on to the next question the majority of the cases of CMV retinitis occurs in HIV infected patients with CD4 count, with CD4 plus T cell count less than, the options are less than 25, less than 50, less than 150 and less than 250. So, you come across this CMV retinitis when CD4 count is less than 50 cells per cubic millimeter. And this CMV retinitis, if you observe, CMV retinitis, it is a necrotic retinal infection. Right, it is a necrotic retinal infection, and this will cause irreversible. Right, this will cause irreversible visual loss. Right, and you have to understand that these patients they will have painless visual loss. 
right painless progressive loss of vision and whenever the individual is about to develop this retinitis these patients they complain of blurring of vision these patients they come complains of the presence of floaters in the visual field presence of scintillations right presence of the scintillations in the visual field right and this cmv retinitis it is usually bilateral and characterized by perivascular hemorrhage right characterized by the presence of perivascular hemorrhage okay and these findings are exclusively present within the retina and how do you treat this cmv retinitis the treatment is intravenous gancyclovir this gancyclovir should be given for nearly around 3 weeks this is for induction therapy then what is that you give as a part of maintenance therapy for maintenance therapy what we give is oral valagancyclovir oral valagancyclovir should be given as a maintenance therapy and for how long you should give this oral valagancyclovir until the cd4 count has increased to more than 100 cells per cubic millimeter until then you should be giving this oral valagancyclovir so if you see the next question a 42 year old hiv positive male presents with two weeks history of cough fever night sweats weight loss and diarrhea he is not on combination antiretroviral therapy and has a cd4 count of less than 50 what is the organism causing the above features with the particular cd4 count the options are cytomegalovirus candidiasis mycobacterium avium complex pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia right so the cd4 count is less than 50 and when the cd4 count is less than 50 what are the most common opportunistic infections that will be disseminated mycobacterium avium complex infection that is one when the cd4 count is less than 50 and the other important infections will be histoplasmosis when the cd4 count is less than 50 then followed by that will be your cytomegalovirus retinitis and then primary cns lymphoma okay so these are the manifestations that you come across when the cd4 count is less than 50 now so if you know this like you have two options one is cytomegalovirus which is there when cd4 count is less than 50 and mycobacterium avium complex infection now among these two which is that which is responsible for cough fever night sweats weight loss and diarrhea that will be mycobacterium avium complex infection so the answer is mac here so if you take some important points related to mac infection mycobacterium avium complex infection it is an aids defining opportunistic infections and this occurs predominantly when the cd4 count is less than 50 cells per microliter and the most common presentation is disseminated disease with fever then weight loss and the presence of night sweats so these are the features of uh, mycobacterium avium complex infection and how do you diagnose this mac diagnosis of the mac is by culture of the blood that is one important investigation and or you need to do the culture of the involved tissue that is how you need to diagnose this mycobacterium avium complex infection and what is the treatment the treatment it consists of clarithromycin or you need to give azithromycin this clarithromycin or azithromycin should be combined with ethambutol or refabutin okay 
So this is how you need to treat mycobacterium avium complex infection. So the answer is MAC. Now the next question if you see all of the following are the AIDS defining illnesses except the options are encephalopathy attributed to HIV, invasive cervical cancer, mycobacterium tuberculosis of any site, oral crush that is by candida. The answer here is candida oral crush it is not the AIDS defining illnesses whereas candidiasis of the esophagus will be the AIDS defining illnesses. Candidiasis of the bronchi that will be the AIDS defining illness. Candidiasis of the trachea this will be the AIDS defining illness. Candidiasis of the lung that will be the AIDS defining illness. Okay, So candidiasis of these organs will be the AIDS defining illnesses but not the oral candidiasis. Now let me show you all the features or all the markers of the AIDS defining illnesses. So candidiasis of esophagus, bronchi, trachea or lungs that is one. Next cervical cancer or invasive cervical cancer, disseminated or extrapulmonary cochidiomycosis, cryptococcus extrapulmonary, cryptosporidiosis, chronic intestinal that is greater than one month duration, cytomegalovirus disease other than liver spleen or nodes, cytomegalovirus retinitis with loss of vision, HIV related encephalopathy and herpes simplex causing the chronic ulcer for more than one month duration. So these are AIDS defining illnesses, right? Very, very important point. And not only that, even your Kaposi's sarcoma, histoplasmosis, isosporidiosis, Burkitt's lymphoma, immunoblastic lymphoma, mycobacterium avium complex infection, these and even your mycobacterium tuberculosis, all these are the AIDS defining illnesses, right? Next, moving on to the next question. Which of the following is true about the H acute HIV syndrome? The options are incubation period of acute HIV is around one week, weight loss is not seen, virus is transmissible, opportunistic infections do not occur. So the question is which of the following is true about the acute HIV syndrome? Remember the virus is transmissible in the acute HIV syndrome and if you take this acute HIV syndrome. What are the characteristic features? Characterized by the presence of wide virus dissemination. Right? There will be wide virus dissemination in case of the acute HIV syndrome. And not only that, even the virus will get seeded within the lymph node in case of the acute HIV syndrome. And the virus is transmissible in the early infection period, right? In the early infection period, the virus is transmissible. And if you take the incubation period, it is around 3 to 6 weeks. That is the incubation period. And the acute HIV syndrome is typical of the acute viral syndrome. And it is almost similar to that of the infectious mononucleosis. And the clinical findings include presence of fever, sore throat and as well as lymphadenopathy. And along with that, there can be also development of rash, headache, arthralgia and as well as anorexia or weight loss. So, this is what is the features of the acute HIV syndrome. So, incubation period, it is not one week. So, how much it will be? Around three to six weeks. Weight loss is not seen is a wrong statement. Weight loss can be there in patients with acute HIV syndrome. And opportunistic infections do not occur is a wrong statement. Opportunistic infections can occur in case of the acute HIV syndrome, right? Then coming to the next question, which of the following is true about fourth generation serological testing for HIV? The options are it is used to confirm the diagnosis of HIV. It detects the HIV antibody and as well as antigen. It has lower sensitivity compared to first generation HIV test. The th fourth option is it cannot be used to detect the HIV 2 antibodies. The correct answer here is it detects the HIV antibodies and as well as the antigen. So you have totally four generations of the serology. The first generation if you see it will detect only IgG antibody. Second generation also will detect only IgG antibody. But third generation if you see 
it detects both IgG and as well as IgM antibody. Whereas fourth generation, if you see, it will detect the antibody that is IgG and IgM antibody, and it will also detect the P24 antigen. So these are the four generations of the serological test, out of which the fourth generation will detect both the antibody and as well as the antigen, right? And the last question of the discussion, the most commonly used confirmatory test for HIV is radioimmunoprecipitation assay, that is REPA, P24 antigen capture assay, ELISA, and then the Western blot test. Remember, the most commonly used confirmatory test for HIV will be the Western blot test. This Western blot test will detect the specific antibodies against multiple proteins. So, this will detect the antibodies against multiple proteins okay now these antibodies are being formed against the three major hiv genes what are those three major hiv genes that is gag then pol and then n against these particular genes the antibodies are being formed and this western blot test it has the highest specificity in determining the these antibodies okay so that is about your western blot test so these are some of the questions related to the infectious diseases particularly the hiv thank you very much